Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Takashi Kegami from University of Tokyo. And he has had several contributions to the field of artificial life and complex systems, not only from a scientific perspective, but also from an artistic perspective. So uh, in his lab, uh, really multidisciplinary research uh, takes place. Uh, and he will speak today about uh, problem of open-ended evolution. So please, Takashi. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So thank you very much, um, Carlos. Um, let me upload my slide. Can you see my slide? Okay. Um, Okay, thank you, Carlos. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be at your uh, lab, uh, even remotely. And then <clears throat> I'm very happy to talk about my uh, my recent work, which I'm also going to talk about this in in the workshop in coming artificial life conference uh, in in virtual Prague. And the title is uh, "Can Mutual Imitation Generate Open Ended Evolution." OEE is short for open-ended evolution, and I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about this. And also, I have to mention that this work was uh, supported by this uh, Japanese uh, science grant called Kakenhi, and it's called Brain and AI, uh, how we go beyond this. So <clears throat> first of all, my motivation of this uh, talk is about how the mind is contagious. So mine is contagious is is kind of my um, uh, idea when I was discussing with my uh, collaborator, uh, Martin Hankovic. It's a long time, like 12 years ago or something, that maybe, you know, it's, it's difficult to generate mind in artificial systems, but maybe it can come from other uh, living systems. So if the mind is, mind is contagious, then we can make a, a, actually the artificial creatures by let them interact with a, with a real biological system. That's the basic idea. Right? So I was exploring this idea by studying, you know, uh, sort of imitation games or mimetic behaviors of um, uh, artificial systems. In this case, I am using a humanoid uh, robot called Alta or Alta 3. And this one is autonomously imitate the human poses, human uh, behaviors in front of him. And then he stores memories and then in, uh, again, continuously inter interacting with, uh, with, with human subjects. So that's a uh, very preliminary experiment, but I, want, uh, that I found some interesting uh, um, the, uh, ex the results and analysis, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, and then also, I, ha I also have to explain what is OEE. Uh, this one is called Open Ended Evolution, and then I think this one is the one with the uh, obsession of artificial life studies for more than 30 years, because the people uh, try to understand why only the human, uh, why the technologies and uh, invented by human can constantly uh, creating new uh, novelties. And then also biological evolutions can create a new species, you know, over a certain, <clears throat> over many, many years now, right? So uh, we have to know what's this, uh, the mechanism, why biological evolution, why human um, control, the technologies can, can develop Forever, I don't know, but forever. Like uh, as you know, the Moore's law tells us that you know uh, technological uh, novelty is still going up. Um, the definition of open-ended evolution is, as it's it's written here, it's a diversity produced dynamically through the processes of evolution or artificial evolution that has is led life creative. Uh, uh, productivity is called open and evolution. So basically, it's uh, it's the kind of dynamics that you know 
constantly creating novelty over and over without you know uh, saturated at certain level. This is what we call uh, open-ended evolution, and uh, this one is a a pickup from um, the recent uh, uh, web forum, which is is put up by Norman Parker, and uh, the website is here, the open-ended pro life org. So uh, you can put up, uh, you can find interesting papers related to open-ended evolution and another um, seminars related to this one, I think. So open-ended evolution that if you can uh, find something, that's a very, um, it's still, you know, missing what's, what's the mechanism. And in artificial life studies, uh, if you want to do something with open-ended evolution, you find something interesting, uh, the mechanism can create a novelty in your computer program or uh, chemical experiment, then please submit to the ADAF conference. So uh, today's my talk is, it's it's not open-ended evolution from a, a pure artificial uh, artificial system, but once the artificial system or my Android is interacting with a, with a human, human subject or human, then, you know, uh, this uh, open-ended evolution seems to happen. Right. Um, from from this uh, ha uh, humanoid uh, side, so uh, I want to know whether the humanoid uh, author, even if it's interacting with the human, uh, can generate open-ended evolution or not is the is the question. And then if we can find the mechanism that you know it's not the pure uh, artificial system in the vacuum, but if the artificial system is interacting with, with uh, other biological systems, then artificial systems can generate um, novelty constantly. Then I can, I can call it, you know, the pseudo open-ended evolution, which I think it's still um, cannot, you know, directly answer to the question of what's the mechanism of open-ended evolution, but um, I can partially answer to this question, I hope. So, um, <clears throat> so um, my my series of studies in art, of art, uh, Android started uh, since 2016, where I met uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro. He's uh, the master of uh, Android. I think internationally he's not well known that he came to my office or I don't know whether I met him in one of the conferences in the UK that he said, um, he said to me that I know that you're working on artificial life, but artificial life is still difficult to understand because of these cerebral creatures or some programs, you said that's the life, but you know, it's, it's difficult to understand this is life, right? So you, Takashi, you have to use something that everybody can understand like a uh, human-like robot or something. So he, so I was, I agreed with him because right? I was working with this uh, radio droplet. It's moving around like, I was like uh, showing like behaviors, but he didn't agree that this is like, this is life, right? So uh, I decided to use Android to show whether this Android is, is, is even life-like by using my programs and some of this uh, uh, new, uh, new model or new program inside the robot. And then we also wrote a book, which is, uh, which is called In Between Man and Machine. Where does mine exist? Uh, it's only in Japanese, so I hope, I hopefully I can uh, write the English version of this one sometime. Um, <clears throat> so I said, uh, I started uh, making and Android uh, since 2016. The first one, is called author one, A A L T E R. Author is coming from uh, alternative mind or alternative uh, robot, because the alternative thing is that it's something. It's a different uh, principle to make a robot. Usually, the robot is to optimize something or to replace human human behavior, but this author uh, alternative robot is uh, totally the principle of a biological principle. So, uh, so autonomy or autonomous behavior is the center of this robot's the design principle. And then auto one is the first one. And then they, I put the 
uh, autonomous sensors, uh, principle of uh, stimulus avoidance, and then a uh, couple of the chaotic map. All these uh, autonomous uh, dynamic systems uh, are based equations and models uh, installed with the robot. And uh, maybe you know about this uh, spike neuron, but uh, we use the uh, Izikovic neural uh, model, which is a very simple uh, neural model. You can see here that, you know, by the way, Carlos, can you see this uh, green, right? I don't think you can see this. Sorry. I can uh, see so you your can cursor. can see this uh, arrow, right? You can see this, yes. uh, my pointer, okay. Yes. Yeah, so this, this is the equation that probably, um, if you are working with the neural neural network that you can I have seen this. So uh, V and U are two internal variables that can describe how the neural spikes when there is a, a external uh, signal is coming from outside. Um, then the spike is propagating to other neurons. So this uh, basically the Izikovic neuron has the four parameters and then changing four parameters, they can have a 20 different kinds of neural behaviors which is a very big advantage of new, uh, this which you know. And also it's one of the fastest uh, simulator of uh, biological neural cells. So that we use this one. And then <clears throat> this one has um, one of the two, uh, 20 different kinds of neural, uh, ne neural properties. We have uh, excitatory neurons, we have uh, inhibitor neurons here and here. So we basically use 80% of excitatory neurons and 20% of its inhibitory, inhibitory neurons, which is what we observe in the cortical brain over, over, over human brain. So that's the reason why you use these two sets of parameters, excitatory and inhibitory, which we found in our biological brains. And second, the, uh, one of those papers that I, we, we we discovered that this uh, spike new <clears throat> this uh, Izikovic neuron with a uh, with a uh, uh, time dependent uh, plasticity spike time dependent plasticity shows very interesting uh, adaptation to the environment. For example, like this robot, you know, installed with this Izikovic neuron with this, with uh, with heavy and learning, which is spike time dependent uh, plasticity. So. If this neuron, post neuron fires and then postsynaptic neuron fires, and then <clears throat> then firing timing is within a 30 milliseconds, then the uh, the, st uh, the strength of a synaptic connection goes up. But if post neuron fires before the play neuron fires, then this uh, connection goes even down. Right? This is what uh, spike time dependent plasticity. So once this robot is you know, uh, crashing on into the wall, but uh, if they can um, avoid crashing into the wall, then this uh, this property is uh, preserved and then conserved simply by the Hebian learning with with some uh, uh, nice connection. That's what we found in our, uh, in the small systems, and then also in, in uh, hundreds of uh, or thousands of uh, uh, Zigbit neurons that we can find this um, uh, self-organized adaptation. And this one is also used in, in this Android. Um, so the next one is, is the autonomous sensors. Like uh, the sensors, the auto has the sensors, it, which one is IR sensors. And then the first one has the temperature sensors also, right? If the environment has becomes high temperature or low temperature, well, if the pe people are coming close to the Android or go away from the Android, this is uh, sensed by those sensors and then uh, <clears throat> uh, circulated in in the neural, uh, inserted into the into the Izikibit neural network. That's what we did in this first order one. Um, it's a bit complicated, but I'm going to talk about all three today. So uh, I'm I'm skipping here. But the the, the point is. Uh, this auto one has a bunch of uh, autonomous unit inside, like um, Izikovic Izik neurons, and then also uh, some chaotic maps, and then also those sensors. Those sensors are also autonomously changing its state, 
and they are coupling together and then generate um, the behavior through the through the uh, air actuator of the robot. I, I have a sim simple, uh, uh, when I made this auto one, uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of press came to interview me. And this is one of the interview from the UK, so you can listen to this one. Can, can you hear this? Oh, no, okay. Um, so he said he maybe you can. Uh, so I I can I I can skip here right because this is just uh, <clears throat> this uh, press says you know uh, this Android has has a free will. That's the creator said, but uh, I, I didn't say this. You know, <laughs> so this uh, misreading. But one one of my ideas is that whether this uh, autonomous modules inside the robot can generate a free will as, as a whole, right? And then. But you can still uh, see this when you come to Japan. Um, and then um, I move on to order three, order two and three, which I made uh, recently. Uh, and thanks to Mixi, which is uh, the company founded uh, this to, to come up. Um, so order three, Comparing with older one is a bit complicated uh, because um, it's, I, th I thought older one was interesting, but it's, it's so difficult to do something uh, meaning meaningful. But it's not it's sense making is very difficult for older one to do, right? So uh, I I put some you know. Um, some sort of a meaningful behavior. I, I try to let uh, author to do some meaningful behavior. One is uh, what I call uh, imitation uh, of, of a human, right? So the author three now we have um, um, sensors, which is um, uh, visual sensors, means that there is a camera inside the eye, and then camera using this camera uh, using open pose that extracting body, body structures and try to do some imitation of this body using this um, extracted body structures. Then uh, there's, um, uh, we also calculate optical flow. And then finally we can uh, generate um, the behavior of the old author by using this, uh, um, this computation. I'm, I'm going to discuss this again and again, right? So, so simply, there's a sensors and the brain part, and then body part. Body part is uh, aluminum, uh, stainless steel, ion. This is what we call author's body, and then there's a 43 degrees of freedom with the uh, air actuator. So, air actuator is actually from zero, zero to 255. Uh, different levels which is controlled by the program within the brain part in the brain part it's, a, it's two classes one is a more like ai part and then the second part is more uh, autonomous part which we inherited from auto one so there's a spike neural network plus uh, spike time dependent plasticity so the, the neural fires and there's the ai part so uh, getting uh, images from eye and then compute how to imitate it and then generate uh, how to imitate the behavior with by adding some uh, spike neural uh, output from this spike neural network, right? So it's a combi combination of a spike neural autonomous behavior and then also a computed imitation uh, behavior and put them integrate together and then output uh, into this 43 degrees of freedom so that uh, using the air actuator that the author can imitate the behavior or the pose of the human subject in front of him. And then author three has microphones, view sensors. Well, IR sensors and bending sensors and piezoelectric sensors also, but uh, for the imitation, uh, interaction here that uh, we are not going to use this 
this uh, one. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to talk about this bending sensors and piezos. But uh, basically, the visual sensors is with the eye, by the eye coming camera is more important um, to understand here. So uh, comparing with uh, authors, what's the big difference is is that Orta 3 has um, self images, memory uh, capacity uh, is the memory, and then I, I camera, and then also imitation modules. These are the uh, new properties that we inserted in Orta 3 comparing Orta 1 and 2. So it's still very o autonomous, but still, uh, but also, you know, there are those um, meaningful modules uh, inside it which you know you, you normally the people call it uh, ai type uh, modules because uh, we use open pose which is deep learning neural network inside but it's more like uh, what people want to call it ai right but uh, plastic neural network which is uh, very autonomous and then you know uh, it's uh, thousands of neurons is coupling each other and then generating uh, sort of new what we call neural noise and then combine them together and generate the behavior. Um, so I want you to uh, remind that these are three big um, modules or the three big things in, in this uh, all the three. One is uh, built-in self simulator or self-awareness. So usually when we do something, we don't know how we look like, you know, from outside, right? When I, I do this or I do that, I'm so I know that I'm raising my left hand, I'm raising my right hand, but I don't know whether we can how we, we, I'm look like uh, from from the outside. So we put a self simulator uh, so that the author can can tell what his his pose is, what his his uh, behavior look like. The second thing is that author has open eyes or closed eyes mode. So uh, we call it awake mode and dream mode. So when it, awake mode, the author uh, can open up eyes and see the human pose in front of him. But in a dream mode, that he closes his eyes because nobody's there or he, if, when he cannot imitate. He tried to remember how he played, how he behaved in in the past, and then he tried to recruit uh, his poses in the past to generate the behavior. Uh, okay, so this is dream mode. So he's spontaneously switching from awake mode to dream mode, and then also coming back to uh, from the dream mode to the awake mode. So these two modes is uh, is very important. And then the second, uh, third thing is a memory uh, selections and variations. So <clears throat> the usually the, the robot doesn't have a memory or because usually the people use the neural network or deep learning. Um, you cannot say this, this robot has uh, thousands of, of different types of memories or you cannot say this one has a 10, 10 uh, memorized patterns, right? So we explicitly uh, let author has uh, 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 let author to memory to to, to memorize um, like um, um, hundred thousands of memories in his in his brain. So it's apart from the neural network or other parts. This is a memory uh, storage like a computer, and, and then. Uh, author can select or well, can, can search in the memory to pick up um, to, 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 to generate his, his behaviors. Why I, I, I have chosen this memory uh, selection uh, thing is because um, I'm still, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, um, uh, the idea of the Darwinian evolution causing in the brain. Like uh, Edelman, uh, he passed away uh, a few years ago, but the Edelman's, um, Edelman's idea is that uh, evolutionary processes, processes is also going in the brain. And but the big question is what's the repertoire 
of the of this uh, Darwinian selection in the brain. So our idea is that the memories can be the Darwinian uh, the unit of selectors. So that the memories of the brain is sometimes um, you know replicated with some variations where they can um, combine this memory and this memory to create new one. So these are the, the like brain evolutionary processes it's happening in, in the brain. So Darwinian evolution in the brain is the, the third thing that we uh, installed. And then plus plus that uh, um, Otto Messer, uh that he also um, um, wrote a very interesting paper called the artificial uh, cognitive map. Uh, I guess 40 years ago, and which also um, uh, triggered my motivation for doing this. So uh, the auto three is very hybrid, but with autonomous behaviors, and then also uh, some of the classic um, memory storage based uh, AI circuit. But then um, I let him uh, interact with humans. And then also philosophy behind uh, this idea is that uh, uh, the famous Hel Helmholtz, uh, he's a physicist and also a psychologist. He pondered that the apparent stability of the visual world under a voluntary eye movement in 1878. He remarked on the fact that in dreams that the particular landscape may change in the reality fashion during the commotion. That's his ideas, uh, which is also mentioned in Otto Wessler's paper then um, after that, uh, that uh, Peter, the, the famous paper by this uh, Hinton and you know uh, uh, Radford and other people, so wrote uh, Helmholtz machine paper, which Helmholtz machine is an artificial neural network that through many cycles of sensing and dreaming and gradually learn to make their dreams converging to reality, and in the process create a the internal models of the fluctuating world. So this is something that I'm, I'm that's motivated my uh, my active my, the, the architecture of the author three. That uh, the, as I said, author has the awake mode and dream mode and spontaneously coming one mode to the other mode, uh, depending on the context that author three is. Uh, in terms of the circuit of the comparator model. Uh, I, I don't know whether if you know uh, this um, the, the famous model by the Frist, uh, the comparator model of the brain circuit, is that you have um, uh, the information is coming from one module or information com coming from the other module, then comparing with those uh, computed results, then decided which way to go. That's what the comparator model is. And then we used, uh, based on this uh, structure, that we use a memory, uh, autonomous mimicry capacity, and then self simulator. Uh, so, and then also self uh, spontaneous dynamics, which I said this one is by the spike neural network. And this part is a, a mode selected go to the awake mode or go to this uh, dream mode. Is selected by uh, determined by this circuit, and when there is a human, you know, uh, so interacting with the human, and then feed feed back onto the circuit again. So um, if there is a human, uh, then through this uh, uh, visual senses, they extracted the body structures, and then try to copy this body uh, this extracted bone structures, and then copying those uh, body uh, bone structures into this altar, into the 43 degrees of freedom. And then he generated a self images by like this self image, self simulator to see whether this, his behavior is pretty much the same as the human pose in front of him. Because of this altar three, um, because of the physical body constraint that you cannot 100% control it because still, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, controlling by the sensor to the motor is, is unstable. So that uh, if, the, if his pose 
supposed to imitate the human behavior is not 100% uh, good enough, then he goes to uh, seek the memory right here, right? Go to the memory to see whether there is a better behavior he did before, right? So he pick up one of those poses and then generate um, instead of you know uh, copying directly from the from the behavior that he is seeing from, from from in front of him, and then the evaluation of the goodness of of of, of imitation is by the optical optical flow be, uh, around his uh, around the body. So if the optical flow optical flow is that differences um, in successive uh, screen images, and then the behavior is optical flow is is strong around here that you know and then memory behavior is is better to imitate this uh, optical flow pattern then he tried to choose it right? that's what he did um i know this is a bit complicated but i i, I skipped this pretty effective part so i think you can get a better images from this picture, this is uh, actually the computer screen from uh, when I'm con controlling uh, this sort of behavior. But when we see the behavior in front of him, it is a camera extracting body structures and then computing this uh, optical flow. And this is a self image. So if this one and this one is same, uh, means that the behavior is similar, right? You can see this. So when you see this, uh, take the extract extracting bone structures um, self image is, is similar to this, uh, computing the optical flow. And if it's similar, then uh, the author decide that the, his imitation behavior is exactly the same. I mean, can be, uh, can be uh, successful. So this is what you can see that you can extract the body uh, struct, uh, bone structures, and then uh, try to copy these bone structures using and um, putting it to the 43 degrees of freedom of author's body and then evaluate whether this imitation is good or not. I see. So this is what happens when you, this is what happens when you, uh, uh, this one was I did in, in Barbican or just, just set off in, in Germany. That this guy, the, my, my collaborator, that he tried to do something and all the three, is try to imitate his behavior. As you see, this is not 100% perfect, right? So he does some some weird thing, but uh, basically he tried to follow, try to imitate the behavior that uh, what he does in front of him, right? So, when the interaction goes on, goes on, that as you see, that sometimes you know, uh, human subject is try to imitate uh, author's behavior, right? Because it's uh, you know, uh, once you're interacting with with author, that uh, there there is a sense that they are doing some something collaboratively with each other, so that not author is imitating him, but also he is going to imitate author behavior. So once again, that I said. You know when there's a uh, in order to uh, imitate, but and then taking this uh, uh, there's a so extracting bone structures decide what to behave and this the motor command is coming and then putting into the self simulators, but also then also it's memorizing its behavior and from self simulator that you can co compute the optical flow and if the optical flow is similar. Then he just execute that what he decided to do, but it's not. Then it's going to go to the memory structures and then picking up something. Uh, so there's a direct imitation loop and then also memory loop. So once you uh, try to generate uh, the behavior, uh, the output from the spike neuron is added added onto this uh, to command, so that the author's behavior is not hundred uh, percent perfect. But it's a little bit perturbated by the neural noise, uh, but uh, that this neural noise is very important to 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 generate and then interact with the, with a human being. Um, 
also very, I think it's a very important thing is that it's not always that somebody is in, in front of you, right? Somebody is in front of altar. So the, when there is nobody, the altar is uh, playing by himself. So he tried to spontaneously retrieve uh, memory, uh, retrieve poses from his memory, and then he executes the behavior. Then he also uh, put a neural noise and then storing again. Restoring, uh, retrieving, playing he, by himself, and then restoring again. By this, by this way, you know, uh, he's picking up poses and creating the variation of his pose, uh, memorizing again, right? So it's like a, you know, um, natural selection of the species, taking uh, mem each memory as a one species, picking up the memory, and make variations, restoring again. So there's the ecology of memories. That's what he can do while there's nobody, right? So, so uh, for Ota, it's very important, you know, that when there's nobody around him, that he can play himself to uh, train his memory, right? That's how he can, you know, uh, escaping uh, mere uh, copying behavior to generate his own behaviors. So it's quite interesting that, you know, uh, not just the copying behavior that he can generate uh, his personal uh, properties, but because of this, uh, this, uh, this timing that he, around nobody that he can play by himself, then you know, uh, he can train his memory structure so that he can personal behavior, personal you know, um, nature is emerging or self-organized by, uh, by this processes. Okay, so, uh, so this is how he behaves when there's nobody. So he, he tried to play the behavior that he remembered, what he memorized from his past interaction. Yeah. Um, is there any questions or something, Carlos? Is it okay? I think we can save them for, for the end. Oh, so, okay. So how many, how, how much money, how much time? There, okay, so look at that, I can, I can get the questions uh, at the end, but uh, how much time that I have? I, I guess if you can wrap up in 10 minutes, we'll be fine. All right. Okay, so um, in order to um, analyze this behavior, um, I use a UMAP. UMAP is a very, um, recently a very popular way to compress um, time series into the 2D space. Um, I don't have time to uh, explain this in, uh, in short, but um, you can see this, as you can see that uh, the blue ones, and then blue ones is a direct imitation behavior, and then blue one, uh, red ones are imitation behaviors, uh, the retrieval from the memory. Right. And then it's a behavior pattern out of time series is compressed onto this uh, to this space that you can see um, red one is it, deviating from it, right? The blue one is just a direct uh, direct imitation. The red one is uh, generated from uh, Darwinian evolutionary processes so that uh, even though it's copying and interacting with the human, because of author sometimes fails and then also because nobody around him uh, when he was uh, interacting with the human, the memory structure becomes diversified so that uh, you can play um, different behaviors. It's a creation of a new kind of uh, behavior mo motions. And uh, this is uh, the time series, whether the, you, when there's nobody and then when there's a human, the, how uh, this, um, when there's uh, people, it's always, you know, uh, sometimes they use direct uh, imitation processes, but sometimes using um, uh, red one is a memory uh, retrieval from the memory. It's a combination from the direct loop and then also memory loop. But when there's nobody, you cannot see anyone in, in front of you so that you have to generate your behavior from the memory so that there's only a red pattern here. But when the people uh, came in front of him, then the red, uh, blue one, blue one uh, come again. So it's switching from the red one to blue one. So um, that you can see 
how his behavior changes over time when there is nobody in front of him. And an interesting point is that, you know, uh, um, when there's awake mode, this is a transfer entropy, so that uh, author, author is imitating human behavior, so that uh, in information is coming from a human behavior to the author's behavior. So the information flow is from um, human to author. But when he, when the author is, is using memory, means that the author fails to imitate human, right? Human pose. And in this case, uh, as I said, uh, sometimes the people try to help author to imitate himself, right? So I didn't, we didn't tell uh, people to imitate uh, author, but the, the people spontaneously uh, was trying to uh, imitate author so that the information flow is now from author to people. That's what I thought was interesting. So it's a mutual uh, uh, cooperation seems to emerge from the uh, information flow is from author to human, but also uh, human to author, but also from author to human so that um, um, spontaneous mutual information is going on. I know there's only 10 minutes, but the interesting point is, is from, I mean, the open-ended evolution is coming from uh, when there are the two authors. Of course, you know, uh, this one is triggered by the idea that uh, Jacqueline Nadal uh, from, from France, that she did very interesting uh, series of experiments with the new kids. Uh, the, um, the kids play to mutual invitation game, and their sort of a mutual imitation game is spontaneously organized. And then she reported how the novelty, how creative behavior emerges from the mutual imitation. And then she wrote a very interesting book uh, recently on, on, the, on this idea. So this is what we happened when we, when I played, uh, when I let two uh, authors playing each other. As you see here, um, the behavior I don't think it's it's not that interesting because it's, well this is a two autonomous uh, uh, program. There's no human inter intervention, right? Order is try to mimic other order, and then this order two is mimicking order three. Order three is try to mimic order two. So uh, mutual information, mutual imitation is going on, but uh, basically two identical programs with a different uh, body structures is mutating each other. That's what we can, you can see here. Then I try to use a uh, human using a uh, um, uh, Oculus Crest to use human body, uh, that author's body to possess the author's body to imitate. So it's, it's complicated, but you can see um, these are the two people, you know, uh, using Crest so that he can, she can use author's eye, and then when she moves, the author moves. So she possesses author two, three, and then other one is possessing author three. So she does something with some time, time delay, the author does the same thing, right? They try to imitating with each other. So this is the case when the human is possessing author, Two and another other one is possessing all the three, and then how this uh, so, uh, mutual imitation goes on. There's another case. Uh, <laughs> So it, this one is pretty much depending on 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 the human uh, personality, right? And sometimes you know uh, does this, and then there is some differences between uh, two identical programs running, and then two human beings is is imitating with each other. So again, this this time I told uh, my students. To imitate author's behavior, and also is also imitating humans' uh, poses. So, first of all, you may assume, you may guess 
that you know they are going to the fixed point, right? But it's not because humans are uh, imitating behavior. It's not perfect, so he does something different. And then my new difference is amplified by the author's uh, behavior uh, program, maybe, so that uh, you know uh, behavior is changing over time and time, and then creating a new one. And then also we did some mirror experiment, but we skip this. So uh, again, we, I used uh, UMAP to see the differences. This is the motion pattern of autonomous author three against human, and then against the programmed author two. So when you see the UMAP, um, more scattered pattern tells you that the, his behavior is more diverse and then more creative, right? And and if it's it's, it's going to uh, Converged, converging into the same, po part of same portion, then this one is more, uh, you know, uh, uh, homogeneous, more uh, identical, right? So it's it's obvious that the motion patterns of autonomous order three against human is more diversified, comparing with uh, with the cases against the programmed order two, right? And again, the UMAP are representation of a motion patterns of order three possessed by the human, right? Um, when possessed by the human against programmed order three uh, is like this against a possessed or uh, against a against possessed order two. So this one is possessed by the human. This one is autonomous behavior. Again, you know, even if um, it's uh, order's body, but still uh, possessed order means that the order behind controlled by the human. Uh, Subject is more diversified comparing with the autonomous program. So, um, <clears throat> so my uh, the, the, so it's a bit preliminary experiment. But uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, once the auto, auto and auto program is coupling with each other, it's more like a, a chaotic map coupling with each other, right? And the diversification of those two coupled map is not so much when compare, comparing with uh, with uh, uh, human subject coupling with uh, uh, other human or author, right? And an author's behavior is uh, the complexity, a uh, complex behavior of author is amplified and and also extracted by the human subject, even if the task is mutually uh, imitating with each other. And then the reason is, I, I was it's difficult to say this, but of course it's a typical. Um, Bottomless uh, found in living systems, like Tom For Forrest says that you know, uh, uh, bottomlessness in in the humankind is essential for the emergence of open-ended evolution. And then here is yeah, this one is too. Once author is coupling with other autonomous author, then open-ended evolution is it's difficult to happen. It's um, it's complex. It's a, but it's still fluctuating around the same behavior. But once you are coupling with uh, actual human uh, subject or author, th author three is imitating uh, other author possessed by the human subject, then his behavior becomes more complex. So open-ended evolution happens once our author is um, Im imitating human behavior, and then human is also imitating author's behavior. And it's interesting that you know the uh, I we're using neural network uh, noise, what I call neural noise, but uh, this one you cannot uh, replace it with uh, with random noise because the uh, neural firing is uh, because of this um, uh, neural network uh, property. They show some global synchronization, and global synchrony is also very important to um, to self uh, imitating. Um, this kind of complexity uh, emerges. I, I don't have time to discuss this, but the, the first part is important. Why why open and evolution is extra, uh, is evoked when it's coupling with uh, with the human subject is something that I think is interesting. That this is also the one of the evidence that mind is is offloaded from mind is offloaded from human subject to author three, and not from the other machine uh, type, uh, machine controlled uh, order. 
And the last thing that I want to say here is that um, uh, it's a very interesting, I mean, it's, it's very much uh, um, fun to interact with, with, with author. So I call it, you know, imitation, imitating communication is emotionally uh, resonating. Um, and this, uh, this is, I think, is very important, like uh, evoking emotion, emotion or in, in imitation game, it's not merely, you know, reproducing the same behavior, but it's, um, it's evolving a new creation of new behaviors. Like you see, uh, like Jacqueline does uh, experiment by the kids, that the mutual information, even if you, you can, you say this is copying from others' behavior, but still copying the behavior um, plus some, you know, uh, some memory and then also spontaneous neural firing that can generate a new, creating a new kind of behaviors, which I think uh, that's uh, the emotional resonance can be the starting point for the communicative musicality, uh, which is, you know, the human has uh, essentially has uh, musicality inside his, his body and mind. And that once you are interacting with other uh, human, then uh, this can be the source for open ended evolution. And so that I think, you know, uh, in order, order to understand the, the, the reason why there's open ended uh, evolution, open ended development between two androids or two. Uh, or between Android and then you know human subject, I think um, this uh, resonate resonation is very important. But thank you very much. Um, so this is my uh, teams of this project that um, basically um, Masumori, uh, Asashi Masumori and then Mari, uh, Nori Maruyama that they he's they're helping uh, programming this uh, Android and then also John Smith. Uh, he's also uh, helping uh, hardware part of this Android. Um, then everything is is on the on the wrist, so that you can um, you can enjoy. And also, uh, Carlos mentioned at the beginning that um, I'm using this author to do some uh, art uh, art things, so that you can, for example, like uh, a Mutech Tokyo that um, I did uh, some performances, which you can see here, and uh, the interview. Interview by the Mutech uh, uh, organization that I I was translated into Spanish and English and another thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Takashi. Very interesting. If anybody has questions, please type them on the YouTube chat, and I will relay them to Takashi. In the meantime, well, I, I have. More questions, but you were answering them <laughs> during your talk. So, um, I, I mean, I, I guess being devil's advocate, uh, some let's say the third referee might say, "Well, since the robots have limited degrees of freedom, how mm. how open can you have something if let's say it has a finite number of postures?" But understand that you're not looking at states of the robot, but trajectories. And of course, yeah. uh, very probably these are infinite. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that's right. Um, actually, uh, even it's 43 degrees of freedom, and then each 43 degrees of freedom has, you know, um, basically you have 255, uh, you know, uh, different states. So. Theoretically, we have like, uh, you know, um, two to this uh, eight, so two to the 300, two to 300, you know, a degrees <laughs> of freedom, so that it's almost infinite. Um, and then, well, it's because of this uh, body structure, it's a uh, stainless with aluminum frame. And then it's, it's, it's not 100% you control it. And then also there's the air, air actuators, right? So these are the another uh, um, mysterious free degrees of freedom that you cannot control counterparts by the by the program. So that this is the um, yeah this is also the source of why this uh, the complexity also it came out from this um, experiment. Well, yes. well, I, I think it was very ingenious, let's say, to compare with humans and then with robots and then with the mirror and so on to to try to distinguish uh, 
how much of the neural complexity or behavioral complexity comes from, let's say, the robot or the human or the interaction. And with Tom Ferris, we, we began exploring this already several years ago when he was still a postdoc here. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah. But now he has been exploring this with students and recently Georgina, a master's student, they, they just published with Tom's group in Okinawa, uh, mm -hmm. a paper where they explore um, the shrinking brain hypothesis, because let's say our cro ancestors had larger brains than we have. Uh, and then the question is why? why? <laughs> and let's say in the simulations with very simple agents, they showed that if you have social interaction, then you can offload some of the cognition towards mm. the social interactions. And of course, as Andy Clark and David Chalmers and others have suggested, you can also offload cognition to your environment. Um, yes, so, uh, yes. Yeah, you know, no, I, I, I didn't know this work, but uh, uh, from from this complexity is, is coming from, not from, uh, his own uh, brain, but because interacting with the human complexity is very important. So the pri pri primary uh, priority is from uh, uh, the environment is, is responsible for the open-ended evolution, right? And then in, a, in the environment, you have to have a living system. So especially the humankind in the environment so that the mimicking behavior is trying to get the information from, uh, from the environment. And the envir environment is the main factor why this complexity is coming out. So it's not from the brain, but from the environment. So I'm very much sympathetic with uh, Andy Clark that it's a messy, messy mind and then also leaky mind that, you know, uh, it's not, you know, the separated from environment. And then it's more like, you know, uh, uh, environment is a representation of what he's going to do. And so that's, more, more or less, you know, uh, the like uh, Rodney Brooks says that you know uh, you don't have you don't have to get everything in your brain, but they, it's it's out there, right? The world is your model. The world is uh, uh, is, is your is a brain that you can use it to generate your your behavior. Yes. So yeah. I agree uh, with Tom. Maybe the Tom is right that our brain is shrinking and then the environment is getting more complex. So that the complexity level is uh, exchanging, so that you don't you don't have to get everything in your brain, but uh, you can use uh, environment as a resource for generating complexity. Yes. Yeah, that's the um, interesting point. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Hiroki Sayama asko. Hi, Hiroki. <laughs> nice to have you here. Uh, how about coupling four individuals, two humans and two alters, together in a cyclical manner with HMDs, such as circular chain of influence, may be possible. So if, uh, excuse me, sorry. So Hiroki suggests what yeah. if you have four individuals like human imitating the alter and the alter imitates a second human and the human imitates a second alter and the second alter imitates the first oh, human. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So it's a <laughs> iteration of uh, imitation, right? So it's a, there's an interesting uh, game called, uh, I, I don't know whether it's a, um, uh, message game or imitating message game. So if you say something to others and then you have, you're you copying the message to the others and then the message is, is gradually changing, right? And that's also happening here. And then because the author is trying to memorize and then when he memorizes, he puts some noise, neural noise, so that he, when he retrieves the memory, the memory is not the same thing that he when he copied from the others, right? So yes. this uh, message game is going on in his brain. That's a, that's a second uh, factor why he can generate complexity. So his his brain is a source for uh, for 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 the variations of his his body structures, uh, body patterns. Yeah. So it's it's nice. So say hello to Hiroki, and then you know the message game is happening in the brain, and then also he does does the same the the message game. That the message game happen in in by using order and order and order and other people, then actually that happens and it's going to be a very interesting uh, open-ended evolution experiment. Yes. Yes, I I guess that this nicely illustrates the idea that uh, creativity can be fostered by serendipity, in sense mm -hmm. that, but of course it's not just randomness and then let's say you you have some creative insight from there, but the
as yeah, to be also yeah. structure. Yeah, yeah. I see. Well, actually, you know, that's also uh, my my point. When we uh, wrote these uh, the papers on this, uh, the, whether you need a random noise or not, right? And then I think the interaction from a uh, uh, environment. I don't think it's 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 random, but it's a structural structured noise or structured something. It's coming from outside. Also, this uh, Darwinian evolution of memory is also it's not just random. But because of this, um, um, the similar pattern is generated. So it's, it's more like a species uh, evolution, right? So this memory A is a retrieved, then A dash is copied, right? So the kind, then it's more uh, the memory type A is selected, and then the variation of memory A is increasing in the memory range. So uh, the dominancy of type A is created if the environment is more homogeneous, right? It's, it's, but if there's different types of people coming uh, to interact with Alta, then different types of memory is uh, appeared in the memory stretch. So that uh, uh, variation of A, but also variation of B, C, and different types of memory patterns is uh, competing with each other and it's increasing its population. So it's more like you know, ecological systems that the memory must uh, keep its diversity by interacting with the more diverse uh, human um, human uh, the human subjects. So yeah, so you're right. Um, randomness is is just uh, uh, the initial something, right? So, but the point is the amplif amplification mechanism. How you can amplify the differences is right. Whether you can use the differences of memory for for uh, for generating your behavior or using the differences to copying into your memory, right? And then, then to generate your behaviors. So like, you know, a couple of couple, couple maps that minute differences is amplified when interacting with each other. So this mutual information is an interesting um, way to amplify its differences and then to the macro level, level macro uh, behavior, behavior uh, level and then can memorize into the memory. So uh, I think this, uh, the feedback loop, or like chaotic, uh, uh, you know, Baker's transformation between two author is something is interesting, but still it's limited. That's the, that's the point, right? Still the chaotic map coupling with each other is the complexity level is bounded because um, it's not good enough to generate more and more interesting uh, behaviors. More important thing is interacting with the humankind, which is is the environment. So once you ha you have to have a, um, you know, open up environment. You know, human is a bottleless, and an environment is bottle bottleless, right? And this bottlelessness is very important to create uh, complexity in order. So open up the uh, state state space, and let uh, map interact with each other is is very important, I think. It's not just you know simply copying from the environment, but it's amplifying this this uh, uh, noise and differences into the macro level, which is a visualizable, visualizable, uh, observable from the from the third person's point of view. And then, so I think it's a uh, yes, the environment and un, un, unpredicted uh, com, uh, information coming from the environment is very important to generate um, mm -hmm. complex behavior in in order. Uh, Anna Yatsin asks, uh, excellent presentation. The nature of human evolution, can it be imitated by artificial intelligence? And this in yeah. turn manages to yeah. evolve like a human being? Um, that's an interesting question. And I, I, I hope so, yes. <laughs> um, that's the, the, the ultimate goal of artificial life studies, right, Carl? Carl? Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, why so much emphasis in the study of imitation in robots? Um, it calls my attention because imitation is also a basic process in the development of human intelligence. In humans, imitation has a social motivation. What would be the motivation in robots? Um, well, uh, well, actually, you know, uh, I think it's a human uh, baby is born without mind. That's one of the idea that the mother is uh, 
caretaker is uh, interacting with with the baby. So there's the uh, uh, pr pr uh, primary uh, imitating behavior happens when the mother laughs and then baby laughs and then mother uh, shows a sub face and then baby shows a sub face, right? And then uh, it's shifting to to uh, independent uh, uh, facial expressions and the uh, individual behaviors. And then also, as you know, um, uh, when the human baby was kidnapped and then was raised by the wolf, the wolf, and then the, this 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 girl, uh, she she had a, a woman. Uh, she had a, a the mind of wolf. wolf that's what I heard, right? Maybe it's rumor, but uh, um, I, it, it, I don't know whether it's scientifically approved or not. Yes. But the but the mind is coming from the community, not from within. So, what what kind of thing that you interest with is where the mind is coming from. So that when if we want to have a robot has um, you know human mind like mind, then we have to copy from ourselves to. To, to the robot. So I think it's, uh, the question is whether the ro robot, like our human baby, can copy mind from human uh, subject is uh, the big question to me. And then, so I think it's mind, it's not, you know, uh, uh, settled from the beginning, but the mind is copying from other uh, living systems. It's, that's, uh, the, that's the principal idea why I started this experiment. So that's why I did this experiment. Nice. Actually, Alan Turing in his 1950 paper already suggests the idea that to have an intelligent machine, uh, let's say you could build a childlike machine and then educate it and, and make yeah. jokes. Yeah. Of course, th this wouldn't mean sending the machine to school because the other kids would <laughs> make fun of the machine. <laughs> they would bully the machine. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. But I, I think, yeah, you know, I, that's, yes, thank you, Carlos. That reminds me one of the one of the things, you know, like these days, the people are using GPT-2 or GPT-3 that, you know, from the beginning that you have to put everything, like, um, you know, what thousand billion you know uh, knowledge is to 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 the AI network so that he immediately can start to speak right. But uh, like 30 years ago, there's the Elma network that you have to train from the from the very small uh, set of corpuses and then it has to raise up right. Raise him raise him up to like uh, by increasing the numbers of the size of the corpuses right. So there. You have to follow the developmental processes of a human baby to let him speak. Uh, you know, to get to acquire language. But the GPT-3 is different, right? From the beginning, you have to have you have to give him a huge set of uh, information, which we have right, right now, right? So it's a two different ways to get a robot to to this uh, matured, uh, matured level. One is, you know, raising up like our baby or uh, uh, give him uh, a sufficient set from the beginning. And then this author's experiment is how we can follow um, uh, human babies' uh, processes, um, uh, developmental processes, by just, you know, little, little by little, you know, interacting with and then having some fun. But I, I, as you said, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, you know, you have to put them into the, into the school, you know, to, to learn with other kids, but, if we can do it, maybe it's very interesting. And then I'm, I'm pretty much sure that uh, uh, the or this uh, humanoid can learn very interesting stuff from uh, other kids, right? So that's what we have to understand. You know, what what kind of thing, what uh, elementary uh, thing do we have to put him, you know, from the beginning? Yeah, that's, yeah. But I, but yes. so I, at the same time, I like your idea that you know let these guys, you know. Put, put into the human school and how they can interest, how they can imitate other kids and how they can uh, generate his own personal personality. Not by just copying others, but because of the copying processes that they can generate his own personal personality and all personal behavior, which I call parthogenesis. It's not from machine to, and then to becoming human is learn from uh, copying from other human being and then you know then he can generate his own individuality 
So evol evolution of individuality is a very interesting. And then first step is how to imitate from others is something is, I think it's very important. Yes, well, one final question. I, I understand that you are not claiming that these robots have free will, but <laughs> no. how, how would you define free will in order to test whether a robot has it or not? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or a that's, human a, has that's, it or not? That's, that's also a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> Zombie problem. Uh, uh, yeah, as a, as a programmer that I, I know what the author is going to do, right? Even though sometimes, you know, uh, un unpredicted behavior uh, we can see from the author, right? I was, you know, why this, why this guy is going to do this, right? Because I, uh, our programmer doesn't, you know, let him do this, right? Or something like this. But maybe some, um, because of the small hardware, some, maybe some uh, memory structures uh, that's something, you know, uh, strange to him. But uh, unpredictable from from the program is one of the definition of free will, I think, for the arti arti artificial life system. So we know 100% what the program is about, but we don't, but we're not 100% sure what kind of things is coming out from the program, right? It's not just unpredictable in, in temporary, but unpredictable in, in sense making, right? So sometimes all the does, you know, more human like, then I, I must say that's a free will because we didn't uh, try to, you know, let him do this. Um, but it, it doesn't still show this, uh, that evidence of free will. So I cannot say whether that's what's going to happen or not. But as, as uh, Carlos, you might uh, see that uh, this is kind of integration of all my uh, integration of all, all the last 30 years of what we have been doing. Like uh, we know chaos, we know uh, neural network, we know uh, sensors network, we know um, uh, imitation modules, we know how to control sensory motor coupling. I integrated everything and I put it into the auto. And if the auto still cannot become uh, human, so what's missing, you know, what's the Brooks juice? Uh, what's What's missing out there is a big question to me, right? And um, yeah, well, of course, you know, well, still the camera is not good enough, maybe, but is that the reason why we, the author cannot become human? But if the memory capacity is not good enough, then we have to increase the memory capacity. If the eye is not good enough, then we have we can replace it with some the better, better qualified cameras and then see how, what happens within a year or something. Yeah, that's, I think that's the one of the, one possible way to see how the artificial life become, you know, the real life like. But, you know, uh, of course I cannot say, you know, more different thing from here, but um, what I can say is this is a integration of every complex systems research. And then we have to see and we have to wait what happens, you know, uh, if still this robot artificial life cannot become biological lifelike, then maybe we're missing fundamental principle or maybe something is missing still. And then that's also quite interesting, but uh, I'm not, I cannot decide whether we are missing still, maybe the computational power, I don't know. Um, the, but that's, uh, that's quite an open question. And uh, I, yeah, I. I I, actually, I, I want to know what that people think about this, right? What's the missing part? What's the missing element that we have to put in here? Yeah, well, that's many things to ponder about. Uh, thank you again, yeah. Takashi. Oh, thank and, you very uh, much. Th this, this last uh, colloquium before the summer break. Uh, so we will continue um, af after the summer in August or September, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have more more talks so stay tuned in uh, our social networks and the web page of the c3 for for new seminars that that we'll have next semester thank you very much thank you very much carlos thank you very much for uh, attending my seminar <laughs>